We're with Don Weaver here. Don, another Legends of Ascot that you're putting on, and um, this is just the beginning of a long day. Your day started at what time? Three o'clock. <laughs> Three o'clock today. Like he says, it started uh, March. March of this year is when we start doing this, and it takes all them days and all them nights to put it together. And we're glad to do it and tickle to death to have this car display here and the people that come. It's about remembering the people who became legends of, of our racing world. And, and we're so proud to have Parnelli and Granatelli and all these cars here. It's fabulous to have a, the array of people who come and have been a part of racing at, at Southern California. We're glad to have them and tickle to death as events going on. And I have to live to 120 because there's so many more people to honor. It's going to take me that long to honor them George all. Here. So I'm George, lucky. tell us about your car. Oh, this start thing started out as a sprinter. It's run just about everywhere. Then we were running it at the Dry Lakes. We run it at uh, California Speedway. It's got various engines, including flatheads. And I sold my Allard the engine we had in it out and put an Arden in it. So it's now an Arden champ car. <laughs> All right. So this car is a what? Tell, give, us, give us some right history. Now, it, right now it's an Arden powered champ car. It started out as an old dirt track sprinter with a good gosh flathead and then a Chevy in it way back. We're down here now with John Lee. John Lee with the Vintage Racing deal here. It's uh, part of the WRA, the Western Racing Association, and uh, this is one of the uh, the early roadsters that uh, John Lee, who is what capacity with WRA? Uh, I take care of the urinals. The sh what would they call them? Sanitary engineer stuff, and sometime I'm the El Presidente. And sometime, uh, it all depends what my wife tells me I should do, you know. All right, John Lee, president of the WRA. And, John, this car is a roadster going back how far? Back in the middle 50s, it was built by uh, a guy out in Riverside, Jimmy Mayata, and his son. And Walt James, uh, I got a 31, a 1921 uh, Model T uh, big car, and I wanted something else. And uh, Walt James mentioned it about eight years ago that Jimmy Mayato was going to sell a car, and I went over to his place, and uh, it looked nice to me. I didn't know what I was getting into. Walt never told me what it cost to keep him up. He just said how much fun you can have, you know. But it's been a lot of fun, and it's cost a lot to keep him up. Thank you, Walter. Ah, oh, we caught up with Don Edmonds, and Don, uh, one of the uh, legends in uh, sprint cars and race cars uh, out of Anaheim, California, one of the uh, builders of uh, many of the tamale wagons way back then. And Don, we have one of your early midgets here that... Uh, this is uh, not early midgets. Well, <laughs> the, one of your... <laughs> In 2000, this is one of your early midgets, but uh, not early to you. Tell us about this midget. It's this pretty car, unique. This is a car built in 1972. It was it's four wheel independent suspension, and the idea was to introduce independent suspension to the kids driving sprints and midgets because they aren't getting rides on Indy cars, and the reason they're not, in my mind at least, is because they do not have any knowledge about the suspension on the cars they were trying to drive. So I built this. It was too fast, too soon. We set a track record with it at Phoenix on the mile. And they decided that they didn't want to run against it, so I had to cut it up in order to make them happy, which I didn't do. I took it home. Then it was sold off to Australia, and they banned it, outright banned it in Australia. wouldn't let it run. So it's been sitting in a barn over there for 35 years, and I was able to buy it back, and I'm tickled silly. Well, going back to the Ascot days, you know, uh, one of the uh, famous tamale wagons was built by Don Edmonds. Had a lot of history and probably um, a car that uh, you remember well. Well, I built several cars for Alex Morales. There was about three or four tamale wagons. There was one that had a uh, turbo offy in it, but uh, Bobby Oliveira won the championship and won for Alex. And, uh, oh golly, we built one with a Mosier engine. 
And, uh, you know, Alex really liked to experiment. He was a wonderful man, I'll tell you. He was a wonderful guy, and I had a lot of fun building stuff for Alex. Larry Fitzenmeyer oh, so is um, here with the nine, number 99 car that's over here behind us. This car says Joe Hunt Magnetos, and uh, uh, Hunt Magnetos, one of the early pioneers of the, um, the Magnetos, and a pretty neat car. So we're going to start with um, Larry and tell us about this number 99 car. Well, this is one of the great old champ cars that raced the big mile circuits on dirt usually. It was built in 1958, originally owned by Lindsey Hopkins and driven by George Amick to second place in the national championships. Then Joe Hunt, who you have mentioned is the Magneto guy, he bought the car from Lindsey in 1959 and he kept it until he died in 1985 or a year before he died. Raced it all over the country. Lots of the big names were in this car. One of the unusual features or interesting points about this car is it was the last upright dirt champ car to be entered in the Indy 500. It didn't qualify, and that was in 1968. Uh, didn't qualify for the race that year, but Gary Bentonhausen took his driver's test in this car, and it turned what, what, what are the fastest laps ever turned at the speedway in a dirt champ car, about 150 miles an hour. So. Uh, it's almost completely original. Some of the paint and a lot of the chrome has been restored, but the chassis, uh, the running gear, even the engine are from the car when Joe Hunt last raced it. The history of these cars is fabulous. The guys who drove these cars were really in a class by themselves. This was a dangerous era. A lot of them didn't make it, but a lot of them did. And uh, it's just really, really exciting to be part of that in sort of a vi vicarious way. Uh, to be sitting in that seat coming around turn four knowing that uh, Bobby Unser and Al Unser and Gary Bentonhausen and a whole raft of other guys sat in that same seat. It's a thrill and I really enjoy it. To my eyes and everyone, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but these old champ cars are just gorgeous. That is my humble opinion and not, not only this one, there are others, there's another one right next to it here that is a beautiful car. But the shape, the design, the class, the style uh, of these particular cars are, uh, it doesn't get any better than this. I'm, I'm privileged, uh, very privileged and, and honored to own one of them. Here with Lee Leonard, and uh, Lee is uh, one of the old uh, Ascot legends himself, goes way back to um, the early days of Ascot, and also Lee is uh, a longtime employee at Edelbrock Racing, so um, his history uh, goes um, you know, far and wide. Lee has brought to the Legends of Ascot um, a, a reunion here today the number 48 Nance. Uh, looking at the car, looking at the cage, you'd say, well, this car doesn't look that old. Uh, tell us about this car, when did it start, when was it built, and a little history. Uh, it's a 1989 Nance, and it has the adjustable front end where you can move the front end up and down. They made a few of those, and uh, it was first uh, driven by Jimmy Oski at Ascot, and then uh, we took it on the Midwest tour, and then uh, in 1990, and Walt Kennedy drove it there, and then Walt Kennedy drove it the rest of the time at Ascot, until the, until the uh, end of Ascot. He had a lot of history with it, a lot of memories with Walt and Dottie and I and Norma and, uh, and even with Jimmy driving it too. A lot of history, a lot of memories, you know, and uh, we had a lot of fun driving it or running the car, you know. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. All right. Well, it looks like it's all together. Would it fire up today? No, it won't fire up today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, caught up with Kenny Van Blargen. Kenny is the owner of this uh, beautiful number seven behind us. And we're going to talk to Kennedy, uh, Kenny a little bit here in a minute about the car. But Kenny himself has a little bit of history. And um, it's uh, Kenny from the racing family, son Tracy. Kenny, um, a little bit about um, your background. Uh, well, I started racing in 1949 in the old clunker cars and just worked my way up into modified jalopies, super modified, finally got into sprint cars. And Kenny, this car has a lot of history and we're here with the uh, Legends of Ascot uh, reunion. Uh, tell us about number seven and its association with Ascot. Well, this car actually was driven by a, a fella from San Diego and it was probably a a B race car, it wasn't really a top car. And uh, at the time, it's the only thing I could afford, so I bought it, then I raced it at Santa Maria. And uh, about that time, the uh, 
four bar cars came was coming in and the spring front cars were going out. So I sold the car and uh, I got a four bar car and I won the championship with it. But this car, a guy bought it and took it to Kansas and they ran it back there and years, years later, I was driving through the little town of Tascadero, which is close to where I live. And I looked out on the, I saw this car sitting on a trailer. Um, and I thought, that looks like my old car. So anyway, I stopped and sure enough, um, I found out who owned it. And the guys, I said, you want to going to do with that car? And he says, well, if you want to buy it, he says, $500. So I thought, well, it's got to be worth that. <laughs> so I took it and then I, I stored it in a barn for about 14 years. And then ASCA, or uh, WRA started racing the vintage cars, so I pulled it out and restored it. And, and they wouldn't let me run a Chevy in it at that time. Now they do, but I built this flathead for it. But you know, I have such a good time with that flathead. I've got a Chevy motor, but uh, I have a good time with the flathead. And I have beat some of the Chevys, so it, yeah, it's just, I'm just going to leave it in there. Okay, we're with Chuck Fossil and... Richard Mastrolio. Richard, good. we yes. we call you what? No, it's my brother you call WAP. <laughs> I'm just a good guy. <laughs> what are the good guys? Chuck, Chuck, great to have you here today. You know, the last time I saw Chuck, we were down at his, um, his farm there with the, the museum. How are things going at the museum? The museum has been sold. All 10 cars are now in the Tom Malloy's museum. All right. And uh, he... You ought to go over there and see that museum, not just to see mine. You've seen mine, Ted, but uh, Tom Malloy's got about 40 Indianapolis cars there, the biggest museum in the world. You put a lot of time and money into that, restored them beautiful, and, uh, you know, hearing that they're with Tom Malloy, good, safe place, I think a good choice. I couldn't have been, couldn't be a better. Tom Malloy is a gentleman, and I always thought I was a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you're with good company here with old uh, Rich here. Yeah. And R.C. Rich is over there. Rich is a good good friend, and RC did most of the work on all my cars. Oh, okay, so there's the mechanic there, old and RC. The driver. I oh I didn't know that. I didn't know he was a driver he too. Was a driver, my sprint car. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you had a lot of faith in him, <laughs> behind the wheel and the wrench. I had to. All right. Well, we had to get a, a shot of you too because uh, a couple of legends here. Can't pass that up. All right, we caught up with Glenn Necessary, one of the true ambassadors and nicest guys with the WRA, and he has brought to number 124. This is one of the old Tony Simon cars. Glenn, a lot of history behind this car. We're going to leave it up to you to fill in the blanks. All right, well, from what I know, this was a lot of Ascot history. It was built by Steve Davis, uh, dragster fame and hot rod fame, metal craftsman extraordinaire and a lot of input by little John Butera, who did everything in cars. And uh, Tony Simon had his best year ever in 1982, and it was uh, forced to be reckoned with, and uh, they cleaned house for a while. Uh, this is a car that uh, Tony Simon actually did very well in, and you just brought up a couple good names. Uh, Steve Davis, and you, call, you said a lot, a lot of nice things about him, but not enough. Steve was actually one of the deans when it come to metal fabrication, uh, worked with um, the Bet I mean uh, the Budweiser team, dragsters, knew everything, did everything, built some beautiful race cars. And then this gentleman right here, Lil John Butera. Huh? We know John. You know some history on John? Well, I know, yeah. He was quite a, uh, he was the father of the billet industry, pretty much, in the hot rod world. And, and he's been in every form of racing and, and just uh, incredible craftsman. And this car, they, in talking to Steve Davis and uh, looking at the parts and pieces fabricated by little John out of the mill, um, they made everything for this car. They made the fuel filler setup. They made the driveline disconnect. They made the radiator. They even made the lug nuts because this didn't run knockoffs. They ran knock, uh, lug nuts on this car. They made the lug nuts. I mean, they just they made the steering arms. They made everything just right in the shop. Okay, so Glenn, as a member of the WRA, you get to deal with uh, Tony Simon. What a guy. What a great guy, huh? Yeah, Tony's one of the one of the good ones. And uh, you know, his his 
health is up and down and he's feeling good one week and not so good the next. I wish he could just get to feeling good all the time, but uh, you know, I just, I had an opportunity to get this car and Tony being the great guy that he is, I just had to, had to get it and had to shine it up.